Davi Vanity raped a child. Police gave him a warning. Now 21 women accuse him of sexual assault. The blood on the dance floor singer is an expert at winning teenage girls' trust and their silence. April 5th, 2019. Updated April 5th, 2019. That is a hell of a headline. That's a hell of a way to start a video, too. Davi Vanity is a famous musician of an awful scene group featuring Davi Vanity, Jay Monroe, uh, a lot of different people over the years. They released nine studio albums before breaking up in 2016. And then it was reformed by Vanity, along with a person named Alan Vanetta. I had heard of Davi Vanity or Jesus David Torres many times because when I was on the internet, there was an interesting uh, character that kind of popped up and was very important on 4chan. Okay, you guys, this is Jesse Slutter, and you I know just what? wanted to say that you guys have ruined my life. First I'm gonna tell you right now, back. this is from her father, you bunch of lying, no good punks, and I know who it's coming from because I backtraced it, Jeez. and I know who's emailing and who's doing it, and you've been reported to the cyber police and the state police. Now, you might know this person as Jesse Slaughter. Jesse Slaughter was, I guess saying the word famous is probably a, a bad thing to say it, but was infamous for this video. Now, Jesse Slaughter, or Jessica Lionheart, had alleged multiple times that Davi Vanity had molested her. Now, there are a lot of allegations regarding this, and we're going to try to sort through some of it. But there is no denying that Davi Vanity is a horrifying creep. Now, as I was editing this, I actually um, realized I didn't talk about a couple things. But we're going to talk about that before we get into the sexual abuse. The other half of the duo, which pretty much was there the entire original run of this shitty band. No offense to Mr. Von Monroe. The other half decided to come out with his statement. And I'm going to link it down below. And I'm only going to talk about certain parts. Because the statement is fucking long. And it's actually really, really nutty. But I'm going to jump around to certain aspects. Again, if you want to see down below, it's in the description. So now we go to a statement. All respect and all honesty, I feel that it is only the right of any fan out there to know why I left Blood on the Dance for a few months ago. As an artist who has changed not only how they look physically, but how they think, write, and create, I began to feel constrictive and creatively limited by the other half of the group. It's around 2014 where we had some progression of having a real message for young people who made up 80% of the fan base. The music sales started to go down because streaming had become the new way of listening to music instead of iTunes downloads. He panicked and insisted on writing material that was based around the older concept of the group, unnecessarily offensive and overly sexual. When your fan base is made of teens, these are usually subjects you'd want to avoid. When I joined at 18, I didn't feel that inappropriate about it until I became older and felt like a pervert singing these songs to kids. I went a few years touring and working for the van, but Davi insisted not paying me. That he wanted to be somewhat of a caretaker and played that role from the beginning. I allowed it because I was young and overwhelmed by the glory of being 18 and touring the nation to meet people that enjoyed the same things I did. I was too timid and with Davi's short temper that he displayed on many occasions by firing his employees, I feared that I would be next. I didn't want to push his buttons and be left with nothing. He paid my phone bill, paid my car insurance, my half of the rent, as well as my medical insurance. Instead of just paying me how an employee should be, but I had enough of this weird daddy relationship. My mother would always ask me why I never had any money or couldn't afford to go see her in my hometown in Florida. It's ruined relationships for me if not just boyfriends with people that worked for him and other bands we toured with and I was manipulated to dislike anyone who tried to call him out. There were times when I literally had nothing, but Davi was spending lavishly on ridiculous novelties, custom-made clothing, flying in random girls to stay and live with us. I finally started to work independently, and after getting permission from Davi in late 2014, that's how I stayed alive. About a year ago, I had gotten very sick for a while, and then shortly after was diagnosed HIV plus and needed to get the medication and medical health started. Yet there was a tour booked for the band. As I saw it, there won't be a tour if I'm not physically up for it, but Davi saw it differently. He kept pushing my face we couldn't afford to cancel the tour, and any medical help I would need would just have to wait until we came back for my treatment. He couldn't afford tour because of the new extreme $60,000 debt Davi put himself in by having just bought himself a new car. 
Though I reluctantly agreed against my better judgment, the god on Torn was dragged all through the country sick as a dog and waited it out. The tour ended up being a total bust. Attendance was lower than ever. The fans were being charged an arm and a leg for a VIP meet and greet, but I was either late or rushed because Davi's a hotel with a girl are canceled promptly because the shows weren't happening. Dates were canceled left and right by promoters and venue owners that heard about Davi's reputation. When we finally got home, I immediately got treatment, and after a few months had passed and a new health routine, I was back to myself. I am now undetectable and healthy, according to my doctors. In October, we released Scissors, the last album we ever did together. I wrote every song in the deluxe version with the exception of two. Davi paid me $1,000 to write all that material in less than a two-week period. I needed a new life. I couldn't be in that situation anymore, yet I had nowhere to go and he knew that, so he took advantage of what he could until I couldn't take it any longer. Davi ended up essentially moving to Ohio to be with his then-girlfriend, and I was left essentially homeless. So I ended up moving back to Arizona with my friend and living a quiet farm life in Tucson while I rebuild my life and start a new career. Recently... Davi opted to continue to tour as Blood on the Dance Floor, still selling merch with my name and my face on, signing my name onto posters I have never seen and touched, and obviously still playing music I wrote for them. On top of being not paid for any of these merch sales using my likeness, he's now saying that he's out on stage performing in my honor, obviously trying to capitalize on my illness as he's referred to his fans. I have been through hell and back and still fighting. I feel like I'm being mocked by him as some kind of cruel joke. I've always told my fans not be afraid to speak your mind and embrace your true self, so I'm taking my own advice. You're the only reason I exist. Thank you all. Now, as, as you'll hear later on in this video, I, I do say my piece about the music, but at the very least, from what I've seen, Javon Monroe actually f seems genuine about it and is actually doing shit now. Now he he does an SFW Twitter thing, and I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna show it because it's it's a little weird to me. I'm not gonna lie, but I, I respect his statement. His statement feels very genuine and very understandable on why he had to like he was a victim too. Anyways, we're gonna continue with the rest of the video. On one Sunday night in June 2007, 14-year-old Diana Farrell sat alone in her bedroom in the dark, listening to a Christian radio show where teens discuss their troubles on air. The host, a man named Dawson McAllister, seemed kind. He spoke to callers empathetically and even gave them advice. Farrell picked up the phone and dialed in. When McAllister asked her what was wrong, she took a deep breath and then told him about a man who sexually assaulted her at her home eight days earlier. A show staffer called the police. The next morning, a patrol car appeared outside Farrell's house in Pinellas County, Florida. Terrified. She hadn't meant to cause any problems, she just wanted someone to talk to. A naive grader who was bullied throughout middle school, Farrell didn't have many friends. Spent most of her time on free time on her computer by herself, creating digital artwork and learning how to edit photos online. Just a few weeks earlier, she'd celebrated her acceptance to a high school with a visual arts program. Farrell Pace is a police officer asked questions about the man she described on the radio. She frankly explained she didn't know his real name or how old he was, he just went by Davi. We met him a while ago on MySpace where he had a popular page as an Orlando-based hairstylist. Davi had told Farrell that he wanted to give her a new look, so he drove across the state to dye her hair at her house. The girl's mother, a single parent with two nursing jobs, had to leave for an evening shift shortly after Davi arrived several hours late. Farrell had performed oral sex on him that night. As the officer pressed for details about the encounter, Farrell's first sexual experience, he started to cry. The 14-year-old was confused about what had happened and afraid of getting Davi into trouble. They started chatting online with leaks leading up to her hair appointment and often signed off messages declaring his love for her. They were friends, she reminded herself, and Davi cared about her. What would happen if she told the police that after finishing with her hair, he'd forced himself into her mouth? Are you going to call him? You can't, Farrell pleaded through tears. It was no big deal, she insisted. Everything was consensual, he said. After speaking to Farrell and her mother, Captain Kurt Romanski, detective from the Crimes Against Children squad of Pinellas County Sheriff's Office, all the 22-year-old Jesus David Torres, a man known as MySpace's Davi the Elite Hair God. Romanski informed Torres he was aware of a sexual contact with Farrell and that her mother would not ask cops to arrest Torres if he cut off contact with a daughter. Torres claims he didn't know how young Farrell was, said he was sorry, and promised not to talk to her again. Lewd and lascivious battery, sexual penetration of a child between the ages of 12 and 15 by an adult, for which Torres was briefly investigated, the form of statutory rape and a felony punishable by 15 years in prison. Ignorance of a victim's age is not an admissible defense under Florida law, and 14-year-olds cannot legally consent to sex with 22-year-olds in the state, but police let Torres off anyways. Victim refuses cooperation of prosecution, the police report concluded. Case closed. Torres moved on. Later that year, he started blood on the dance floor. And that's where this all starts. Now, Blood on the Dance Floor, I'm not going to play um, any audio for you because the music sucks and it's uh, worse than nails on a chalkboard. There's no artistry from a single song from a shitty band. There's nothing. None of it sounds 
anywhere near good. And I'm sorry for people who like these albums, but I, 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 I hate music like this. It's so... Ugh, it's so awful to me. Under the stage name, Davi Vanity, the singer went on to amass close to 2 million online followers while touring all over the country. And in the 12 years since police gave him a warning for assaulting Farrell, Taurus has allegedly sexually assaulted nearly two dozen women and underage girls. Now, it links to uh, a website, they link to a website here called Metal Sucks, who interviewed a lot of the um, sexual assault victim. And we'll read a little bit of this one here. Ty was in the 10th grade the first time she met Davi Vanity, one half of the popular electro slash scene course slash self-proclaimed death pop duo Blood on the Dance Floor. They'd started communicating first via Facebook and eventually by text in December of 2011, when she was already a massive fan. At the time, him getting in contact with me felt like a dream come true, she says today. So when Davi, born Jesus David Torres, Announced that he was coming to her hometown of Houston, Texas, she left with the opportunity to hang out with him. It took a lot of convincing, but my mom let me meet up with him at the Galleria Mall. I recalls. She was upfront with him about her age long before we ever met in person, but the disparity didn't seem to bother him. Ty says Davi's pet name for her was My Little Schoolgirl. He was 27. They ate at the Cheesecake Factory one Friday after school in January of 2012, and although Ty admits the meeting was initially really awkward, she thought Davi came off as being a nice guy. That didn't last long. After they were done with their meal, Davi led Ty to his car, black SUV, in the mall's underground parking lot. He thought he was taking him to another location to meet the, to meet the de facto date, but instead he shoved my face on his dick, Ty alleges. He was feeling me up and I just didn't know what to do. I'd never been in this situation, so I just let it happen. It was not the last time Davi would treat Ty this way. In May of 2012, Davi invited Ty, her mother, and her brother to stay up at his home in Arizona for a week. It was over spring break. I kind of felt bad about my mom, but she let me hang out with someone who was 12 years older than me who had obvious interests in me, but she didn't know the extent of what was happening. Ty also says her mother genuinely thought Davi was a good guy because he paid to get her towed car out of the impound and promised to help with the cost of traveling to his house. We'd driven 23 hours straight from Texas to Arizona to get to his house. Davi never actually paid Ty's mom the money he promised, the sexual assaults continued. He would never ask my permission, take me somewhere we were alone, grab my head, and push me down like a dog. Ty's story about Davi Vandy exhibiting such behavior is unfortunately not a standalone accusation. He was arrested in 2009 for sexual assault, although charges were never filed, and other prominent scene members, like a musician and cosmetic artist Jeffree Star and New Year's Day vocalist Ash Costello, claim to be eyewitnesses to his crimes. Uh, there's a series of tweets here from Jeffree Star. I'm going to speak the truth till I die. We saw at Blood on the Dance Floor Music Davi bring underage girls to his hotel room and do sexual things 100% illegal. I no longer support at Blood on the Dance Floor Music and how disgusting Davi is. Touching children and enjoying the attention is evil. Fuck off, sicko. Being on tour with that child fucker has made me see the truth. I regret ever doing a song with that pig. R.I.P. because you'll never be me. You support that piece of shit and unfollow me because you're supporting child molestation. Davi is the lowest, worthless scum I've ever met. And there's a whole series of posts here from Ash Costello. I, I'm, I'm not I'm not going to read all of this. I'm going to leave a link down below to um, the article. This is the metalsucks.net article. Um, if you want to read all this, because there's there's just a lot. There's there's a lot to this. And, and I'm not going to read every single accusation. Um, however, I do recommend you scroll down and click that link and read the article. The people at Metal Sucks did an amazing, amazing job. And we're, we're going to read um, th this accusation here. Belle from Colorado was 14 when she met Davi in 2013, at which point she had been a Blood on the Dance Floor fan for about a year. I went to every show in my state and Davi always remembered me. He even remembered my dad and would call him dad as well. One night when she was 16, her father drank too much driving back home, which was an hour and a half away. Davi and his then-girlfriend offered him a ride. That kind of made me look up to him more. He was always seeing if I was doing alright and genuinely seemed to care. That facade began to crack when Belle was 17. There was an incident when Davi stopped talking to her for months after she just got to meet him in a questionable neighborhood very late at night, which she says was pretty upsetting to me. I thought I did something wrong. He then started posting flattering comments on social media photos Belle was dressed as the popular DC Comics character Harley Quinn. When Belle turned 18, Davi called her to wish her a happy birthday. We talked for about 30 or 40 minutes, which was mostly, how, mostly him telling me how awesome my boobs were, and that it was finally okay for him to say stuff like that to me. It was a bit uncomfortable to me hearing him talk like that, but I brushed it off. A few days later, Davi called again to say he'd be coming through town. He offered to pick her up at her house since he'd be arriving early in the morning. 
that bed should make me feel safer with him picking me up instead of me trying to find a way to get to him that early. He asked her to p keep the meeting a secret. He picked her up at 5 a.m. when it was still dark out and parked at a location she didn't recognize. Davi started to intimate that he was interested in Belle sexually. I just explained to him that I see him as a friend, she said, but he wouldn't let it go. And then he leaned in and started kissing me. I wasn't expecting it, so I froze up a bit when it happened. Davi asked Belle if she was a virgin. She told him she wasn't, but not by choice. She was assaulted by her ex-boyfriend. He seemed genuinely upset that happened to me. He told me that he hates people like that and feels horrible for everyone who experienced stuff like that. Davi decided to express his sympathy by, well, sympathy by telling Belle she was beautiful, complimenting her figure, and asking to feel her breasts. Belle still wasn't interested, but I don't want to say no to him after all he'd done for me. So she agreed. Things escalated quickly after that, she said. He squeezed my breast a lot, didn't remove his eyes from them and just said how amazing they were. Then pulled my top down and started sucking with them. I tried to back up, but I was in a car so I couldn't get anywhere. I started to get scared and didn't know what to do. I pushed my arms against him to show him I didn't want to continue, but he kept at it. Once he was done, I pulled my shirt back up and he was pulling down his pants. Grabbed my head and started to force it down. I kept telling him that I was not comfortable with this and asked him to stop all while trying to pull my head up. He was much stronger than me and was able to get my head down all the way. Bell froze, so he grabbed my hair and started bobbing my head up and down on him. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to fight him out of fear that he would do something much worse, and I didn't want to participate in giving the idea he wanted more. I just clenched my fist and cried. Dobby even used his free hand to cover her nose. I wasn't even able to breathe. I thought I was going to pass out, but I couldn't do anything about it. Once he was finished, he let go of my head and I cleaned myself up. Then he grabbed me and pulled me close to him, hugging me. He started to tell me that's just how BDSM is about love and trust and things like that. Bell had went into denial about what Davi had done. I truly cared about him, and even after what happened, I refused to believe he did anything wrong. I didn't want to believe it. So I didn't. But the thoughts telling me that what he did was wrong were always there. I just tried my best to ignore him. Eventually, Blood on the Dance Floor's Garbage Corps began to report on the relationship between Vanity and Bell. Their exchange messages showed up on page after Bell had showed them to a friend he thought she could trust. Davi was furious. I tried to say someone must have gone on my phone and took those screenshots. He knew my phone number and where I lived. I was so scared of him coming after me. Just as bad, Bell was racked with guilt. I felt like I deserved what he did to me because I wasn't careful enough. I trusted him, I did this or that wrong, and I always blame myself for it. He says with the members of Garbage Core group, she was finally able to admit to herself that what he did was not okay at all, and it haunted her. She unfriended Davi on social media and ignored texts and phone calls with him. I still do get the occasional thought that it was my fault, he admits. I'm working on it as best I can. Alice also met Davi for the first time in 2013 when she was 15 years old. As a middle schooler, I idolized Davi, she said, and I loved Blood on the Dance Floor. I was completely obsessed. I saw the band live for the first time they played at Martini Ranch in Scottsdale, Arizona, and got to encounter her idol at a meet and greet after the show. When Davi stopped near me, I gushed about how much of a fan I was and how his music saved me, she says, the usual cringy fangirl things. He gave me a hug and asked to see my phone, which he proceeded to put his number into. That alone shocked the absolute hell out of me. Alice and a friend were waiting for their ride home later when Davi approached them. He asked what we were still doing there and if he could help. He was honestly quite a gentleman. The band was leaving for a first European tour the next morning and Davi invited the girls back to his place for a celebratory launch party. Alice called her mother and begged for permission to go. Eventually, she agreed. The party was quaint, Alice remembers. Davi's then girlfriend was there and a complete sweetheart. Video games were played, one of the guys made burgers. Davi gave us full access to their merchandise room so any fans of the party could help themselves to whatever they wanted. Alice wanted merchandise but felt uncomfortable with the thought of just taking it so declined the offer. Davi, she alleges, insisted and took her into the merchandise room. Once I had some merch, he grabbed the doorknob and got super close to me and asked me if I was a good student. I, being the super oblivious and awkward, said not really, and I didn't imply it myself in school. Two returned to the party, but later Davi tried again, asking her to help him in the garage with something. Naively, I agreed. Alice alleges once they were in the garage, Davi blocked the door again and asked if she was a good student. Alice didn't respond. I had finally realized where this was going. He asked me how old I was. I told him I was 15. He made me pinky swear that I could never tell another soul what he was about to do because he could get in big trouble. Then he forcefully kissed me. I was devastated, she continued. I had just found out the rumors about Davi that I had tried so hard to defend his name against were true. Alice alleges the singer then made her perform oral sex on him. He was in total control. He wouldn't let me stand up or even leave the garage until he came in my mouth. I had tears in my eyes most of the time we were there. He made he made me clean up the makeup that had ran on my face with a scarf that was on the floor of the garage. I couldn't tell you how long it had been when we got back to the party, but it felt like forever. Alice's friend, also at the party, was starting to become concerned that Alice kept disappearing with Davi. 
I assured her we were just talking because at the time I was still confused and trying to process everything myself. Felt like the whole night was unreal. Later in the party, Davi asked her to help him pack up for his trip. You think at this point I wouldn't be so naive, Alice says of her 15 year old self, but I went with him to his room. 20 minutes, she and Davi chatted pleasantly about their home lives, their upbringings, and art. Hearing about her love for art, Davi offered her a job designing merchandise. An offer Alice says that he never followed through on. Then Davi assaulted Alice a second time. Davi went into the walk in closet and came out with a rainbow penis shaped lollipop. He asked if I wanted one. I said no, but he insisted and went back and got me one. Singer then called her into the walk-in closet. It was basically a repeat of a garage, only this time he wouldn't let me leave until we had sex too. Alice told of Davi her family's water had been turned off. He promised to give her money to have it turned back on if she had sex with him. I complied if you can call it that. I stood there in shock while he did his thing, thinking I was helping my family. We were so bad off at home that our showers were basically sponge baths using water bottles warmed over the stove. I wanted to do whatever it took to stop my family of five living that way. Pulled my dress down super forcefully, she continues. He actually broke the zipper on my dress. A lot of my clothes were tattered hand-me-downs, including my bra, held together by safety pins, which he actually made fun of me for. He covered my mouth the entire time and was very forceful. He also alleges he filmed her performing oral sex on him. I'm not sure whether or not the footage still exists. I sincerely hope it doesn't. When Davi was done, Alice went back to the party to find most people were asleep, including her friend. She texted her mother, asking her to tell school she wouldn't be in the next day, knowing she'd be unable to cope emotionally. When asked about the party, Alice was initially reluctant to discuss what happened to her. I lied to my mom, she says, and even my friend. I said I had an incredible time, but everything had been fantastic, and Davi was awesome, it works. But once I was in my room, I just broke down. I didn't leave my bed all day. Two days later, Alice noticed injuries stemming from Davi's attack. Her mouth was cut open in several places and there were bruises on her arms. For a while after that night, I just tried to pretend nothing ever happened. It took a while for it to sink in. I'm ashamed of that. He would message me from time to time wanting to meet up, but we never did. That I'm glad. I never ended up with the money or job I was promised, but I see now that was for the best. By her own admission, Alice was a lot, a lot more scarred than I realized at the time. She still blames herself for the attack, I honestly should have known better, and asserts what Davi did to me still impacts my life and how I handle relationships, even now, five years later. And what does she think of Vanity? The man I looked up to is a monster in my eyes. Now, there are a lot more, there are a lot, a lot more accusations that I haven't even covered in this. Blood on the Dance Floor is a lot of things, an awful, shitty music group who's got literally no talent to their name in any of the iterations, whether it be with Jay Von Rowe or by himself or whatever. There's no quality. The music is so awful. I will spare you having to hear that shit. Everyone who's heard of them, if you see this man, this face, don't let him near your kids. Don't go around him. Hopefully, to uh, the Jesus David Torres, hopefully you get what's coming to you. It's only a matter of time but um, you deserve it. Now, anyways, uh, with that, we're going to wrap this video up and we're going to go to the Patreon outro. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for sticking around with me, even though last month I didn't put out a lot. And we're gonna wrap that up. Okay, so for our first and currently only channel membership, we've got Becca Taylor. I'm not gonna read the full name of your uh, handle. I'm sorry, Becca, <laughs> it's really long. Uh, with our first 20, well, I mentioned this before, but our first $20 tier, we have uh, Mio, or Mio Killa. And then in our $10 tier, we have Annie, Amaret, uh, Rebecca Taylor, I think twice total, holy cow, uh, and Fee. At our $4.99 tier, we have Selka Katie, uh, Aslan, Ichi, and Union573. And I realize I just butchered the order of that, but we're gonna butcher the order of the $1 tiers too, so hey. Uh, we have Bailborn in our, uh, Bail, Bailborn, there we go, in our $1 tier. We have Biz Ditch, Seb, Lyra, Charlie, Sydney, the Bean of England, and Stephen Mayer. Th this has been insane, the fact that I have so many people subscribing to me at once. I'm working on restructuring a couple things with certain tiers, including the, the $10 tier for the commentary. I'm working on uh, every three months just recording a big batch of them because I've been three months behind because of my new job. And I, I feel horrible and I feel so sorry for everyone who donates to that tier. I haven't put anything out there and, and I, I feel bad for that. But seriously, thanks to everyone here uh, for subscribing to me for e even on the slower months because there's gonna be some slower months but um, we're, we're working on a ton of crazy things for the channel um, 
you're gonna notice um well i'm, I'm gonna record it actually later because this one's finished and i want to give the next one some time um so we're gonna talk about uh keem interviewing a new victim of romeo lacoste uh, we should have a stream in a few days from when I'm recording this, uh, talking about a few topics like Myconator. That's something. But anyways, with that, I, I thank everyone here for um, being a part of this. I'm nervous, I'm terrified, I, I don't know uh, how to say it other than that, but I'm excited. And I just hope everybody's along for the ride. Anyways, with that, I wrap up the video. This one has been a long one coming. Um, I will see you guys next time.